Access control models are driven by the business needs of the organization. There's some models that are very common. There's some that are seldom used. We're gonna talk about each of those here. In a nutshell, access control models are methods for controlling access to different resources. Resources can be files, they can be data, they can be systems, they can be computers, servers, whatever. And the technique that you're gonna be using in your organization really depends on your organization's business needs. What is your organization trying to accomplish? You have some different tools, some techniques that you can use to enforce access control models. There's tools like Windows Group Policy Editor, very popular Windows tools. There is also SC Linux, which is a group policy tool for Linux operating systems. Of course, SC Linux is open source. Windows Group Policy Editor usually comes with a Windows Server deployment because most uh, access control within Windows is accomplished through a server deployment. In role-based access control, this is, very, is a traditional way of doing access control. It makes things very easy. You would assign a role for every individual in the organization. And those roles may coincide with what those individuals do or what their function is, their role in your organization. So you might have like salespeople, a sales manager, maybe an HR representative in a back room. Uh, you might have a receptionist, for example. Um, or, and you could have quality assurance people those would all be different roles. So you might have in your sales role, the sales people could have access to folders, uh, sales client list, sales software, uh, maybe like Salesforce, that's a pretty easy analogy there. Any type of uh, products or services that they would need to perform their functions. And your sales manager might have access to all of those tools, as well as maybe some financial data uh, they might have access to the HR file. They might have more access than just the sales team. Then your HR manager would be able to access employee records, uh, payroll information, payroll software. So this would not be, this would still be a system within your uh, network, but with different roles, you can assign access only to the people who need it to help uh, promote that concept of least privilege. Remember, least privilege is only assigning the minimum number of privileges necessary for someone to do their job. You might also have like IT people, system admins. These would have access to the security devices, the firewalls, uh, routers, things like that. So that's a good example of role-based access control. You might have, let's take a quick example. You might have a sales department with um, you know, some salespeople Maybe you have like a, you have Michael who's a sales manager. You got like Jim and maybe like a, a Dwight uh, in the sales team, maybe like a Phyllis. And then the manager would have more privileges than the salespeople, but they would have access to everything that the salespeople would too. And then say you brought in uh, people, it makes onboarding very easy. You know, maybe you bring in a temp worker named Ryan. They're placed in the sales team temporarily, so they're given the privileges of the sales team by being placed into the sales group, for example. An HR representative would lie outside of that hierarchy, maybe being shunned a little bit, and would probably have different privileges. Roles in role-based access control can be set for each user individually or managed within those groups. And those groups can contain those lists of privileges. If they move departments entirely, maybe you know, somebody moved from sales to quality assurance, they could be taken out of the sales group and added to the quality assurance group, for example. This makes it much easier for administrators, for systems administrators, to manage those privileges rather than setting it up every time there's a change in personnel. So let's take a look at role-based access control and access. Here we have Windows Server 2019, and I have a couple different groups here. I have a temp workers group, I have a sales group and I have an executives group. So let's say we have a worker here, Ryan. If we look at Ryan, we can see that Ryan is a member of the temp workers group. Now say Ryan gets a promotion. We want to might want to move him to 
the executives group, for example. Maybe he gets promoted to executives. So what we can do here is simply remove him from this temp workers group. And then we add him here. We can type in executive, check our names, and we find the executives group, we hit okay. Now Ryan has all the permissions and all the privileges of the executives group. And he no longer has the access granted to the temp group. So what that does, is it makes it very easy for us as systems administrators to change his access. We can apply here and then Ryan has those new permissions. We could also manage an entire group here. We could see the sales group as Dwight and Jim. And you can quickly view who has these privileges by looking at the group itself. So it's a very convenient method of performing access control. And group uh, Active Directory is how you would use this in Windows, in a Windows environment. You can also add different security settings using group policy management and apply those to the different groups. And that could be a really easy way of applying a security baseline across an entire group. And if you're trying to do this in a Linux environment, you can use SE Linux as a tool for a Linux deployment. Rule-based access control uses different rules to control user access. So these rules are usually stored in an access control list, normally called an ACL. Just like a firewall would use ACLs, you have rule-based access control storing those rules or those plain text statements in these ACLs. Now, a lot of times, rule-based access control or rule-based access is used in security devices, like intrusion prevention systems. So you'd have an ACL that would control access to different systems, different devices, and the IPS would follow those rules in order. Firewalls also often use this rule-based access control approach. So it's an approach to manage access control for devices and systems, not necessarily uh, with a people-oriented approach. So it's very useful for security devices. Discretionary access control designates objects within an operating system. Objects are anything like a file and a folder, and each object would have a designated owner. That owner would be allowed to set permissions for that object. So this kind of places access control in the hands of the users. We can examine how discretionary access control works by looking at our virtual machine here. Here on the local disk, we have the Cybercraft folder. We can right click this and go to properties. And when we go to security, we see the different groups and users that can access this folder. Now we can select the users here and edit the permissions to deny access to deny access uh, for all users. We can select users here, select deny, hit apply, hit OK, and now we can see that those users are denied access to the folder. The, all these permissions are stored in something called uh, discretionary access control list or a DACL. Okay, so we have ACLs and we got DACLs. So DACLs are for discretionary access control. Just makes sense. You have already DAC for discretionary access control, add an L. Now you got a cool sounded acronym and you know how cyber people love their acronyms. Now each object in a Windows system is also granted a security identifier that's stored inherently. It's metadata within the uh, file itself. So it's, it's a descriptor that's stored with the file. When I say metadata, it's a type of descriptor. So every, every um, file, every folder has an SID, security identifier. And you can change those permissions usually to read, write or modify, or owner, or full control within Windows. And you can do the same thing in Linux. With Linux, you usually use set this through the terminal command. Mandatory access controls a little different approach. This is where you primarily use this with classified information. It was initially developed by the US federal government to manage classified information. There's three levels of classified information. There's confidential, secret, and top secret. 
And then you have different compartments, different handling caveats, but those are the three main categories. So confidential, secret, and top secret. So how it's done now in the federal government is that a system is classified at one of those confidentiality levels, and then the access control for that system is all designed around that confidentiality level, that classification. I was a classified documents manager in the Army, so you know, I have a lot of experience doing this. Uh, initially, mandatory access control was designed to break this level of access to have uh, multiple types of classification on the same system and then change the level of access control depending on who's logged on to the system. The government pretty quickly realized that that causes a lot of issues and could lead to leaks, classified information leaks. So now pretty much every system has its own level of classification. So you have a series of uh, computers that are all at the secret level or a series that are all top secret. And then they have different networks. Pretty much they have different networks. There's, we could get into that for a long topic, but uh, you have a secret network, a top secret network, and a confidential network, for example. So users will have access if they have a class of a clearance level at that level of classification and a need to know. They need to have both those things, need to know and that clearance level. So if somebody has a secret clearance, they can access secret systems as long as they have a need to know for that system and that helps encourage that concept of least privilege. And if you have access at a higher level in mandatory access control, you inherit access to the lower level. So you have access to a top secret system you'll be able to access secret information on that top secret device as well because it's a lower classification level. Top secret is the highest, then you go secret and then confidential. Now we also have something called attribute based access control or ABAC. Okay, This uses different characteristics, not necessarily specified for files and folders, but characteristics maybe of a user, for example. A good example of how this is used is in the insurance industry or the financial advisor industry. So say you have a financial advisory firm that services people across the country. They have a hotline. People could call in to get financial advice or to invest their money. And when people call into that hotline, they're matched with a financial advisor that's licensed, licensed for their state. So they would tell the, the phone system, hey, I'm from you know Oklahoma. I need financial advice, and then the phone system would match them, referencing a database that has a attribute-based access control, for example, and find somebody with a license in Oklahoma, and then send or connect that person with that financial advisor from that Oklahoma, uh, has that Oklahoma license. So this is a way to control access, and that, that Oklahoma financial advisor would only have access to customer files from the state of Oklahoma. So that's a way of controlling access, usually within a database, to uh, depending on different attributes. Now, attribute-based access control uses policy statements, which are basically almost like plain English statements. Let's take a look at one here. You have four parts with a policy statement. You got the subject, which is the user being identified, the object, which is the resource, the action, which is what the user wants to accomplish, and the environment, which includes any other attributes, anything other than subjects and objects. So for example, we could say all redheaded employees are authorized to access databases at the Chicago office on Wednesdays. So our subject there would be redheaded employees. It'd be em our employees, basically. Uh, object would be databases. Action would be access, they'd be able to access the information, and the environment would be Chicago office and Wednesdays, and then redheaded would be an environment uh, to that, that type of employee, to identify the type of employee. So those together would read out as a plain English statement, and if you took them on their own, you could piece them together to make like a whole statement. So that's kind of how attribute-based access control is designed to read almost like plain English.